Okay. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well today. Uh, today we have uh, Jenna Yao, who has worked on quite a few games in their time. Uh, they're actually our age, so it's not like, you know. Anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> the narrative design fundamentals, uh, and it's going to be quite the interesting course. So I'm not going to talk too much for today, and I'm going to give the stage to Jenna. Jenna, uh, all yours. Hi, um, thank you for having me another second year in a row. Um, for those that are repeat students or were here last year, um, it's me again. Hi, um, I know more and also less since last year. Um, and for those that are new, hi, it's really, really nice to meet you. And I hope that this is an interesting and useful course for you. Um, so, uh, about me. Um, hi, I'm American, in case you can't tell. It sucks, I'm sorry. Um, I'm non-binary and I'm from the Washington DC area. Um, I graduated with a BFA in game design from the Maryland Institute College of Art. I graduated last year um, and since then have worked on a pretty good amount of games actually. And I'm mostly active on Twitter. Uh, my at is there, but uh, if you check my Twitter right now, it's a lot of me just dunking on my government because the Supreme Court has pulled some dumb shit today. Um, and then the headshot is me with my cat. She's my project supervisor that likes to see what I'm up to sometimes. So she might join us later. Um, these are some of the games that I've worked on. Uh, so Goodbye Volcano High made with co-op mode is what I'm currently working on. Um, I have been working on Spirit Swap since I was still in college. And then I've been working on and off as an editor for Validate. And then That Which Faith Demands was my thesis project that I published about a year ago. Um, and I'll be using it as an example sometimes to discuss like the principles that I'm explaining. Um, so you'll get some behind the scenes info on that. Um, and aside from these games all having me on them, they have something else in common, which is that they're all gay because I'm gay and I bring my personal experience to everything I work on. So what is narrative design? Who knows? It's a very hard thing to define, so I'm gonna do my best. So it's the, it's the way that I understand it, it's the art of providing emotional validation for game mechanics, lore explanations and justifications for game mechanics, and intentionally paced stories and plot delivered in a really interesting and unique way for game mechanics. But I don't like thinking of the fact that like we're just doing this to kind of like paint over a game. I like to think of this as something we're using the game system to do. So instead of for game mechanics, I say with game mechanics. Um, and to go over these terms very quickly, emotional validation is, so validation in game design is the act of providing feedback to a player's actions and engagement with the game system. So like when you're playing a driving game, if you press a button to honk the car horn and it makes a honk noise, and like there's like little feedback that shows the game responding to your action, that's feedback because it's acknowledging that you are interacting with the system and showing you what your actions will result in. Emotional validation is specifically the narrative response that a system provides to the player's actions. So for example, it might be like non-player characters remembering your previous dialogue choices or decisions and referencing those in conversations. Could also be them reacting immediately to those choices as soon as you make them. It also could be systems that are outward facing but ultimately like don't have too much direct input. It's just like an external facing system that lets you know like the personality traits you've been cho choosing, the reputation you've gained through your choices, stuff like that. Um, so emotional validation and system feedback are like one of the most important parts of writing for games because it's what makes games unique more so than books or film because it allows the story to respond back. In the case of static, systems of storytelling like film or books or shows or whatever it's up to the audience members to respond on their own versus in game design you can give the story your input and it will give you something back which is a really cool thing um so lore explanations are a little bit more straightforward 
um, because game mechanics are what the player does in the game and narrative designers or writers or both are sometimes tasked with defining the rest, like how the player is able to use these weapons or this magic system that they have, why the player is doing it, like what are their motivations, like why are they going through all of these levels and like why are they fighting the people they are, where the player is, like the game system and explaining like the super fantastical setting they find themselves in and the rules of it, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially, using lore to explain game mechanics is defining the in-fiction justification for the player, their capabilities, and why they want to engage and move forward within the game. Because some players are drawn to games from mechanical feel and gameplay loop, but others are more interested in the narrative role they inhabit and story they get to help tell via their character. So some people will play a game and disregard the story entirely, but other people will play it for the story and might not be that interested in the regular game mechanics of like hacking and slashing or whatever you choose. So it's up to you to make sure that the explanation for why they're doing what they do, even if they don't enjoy it, is something that compels them. It's technically games writing, not necessarily narrative design, but something kind of unfortunate to the role of narrative design is that there is a lot of overlap with writing. They're not the same thing, but they are often tasked to the same person because our industry is a joke. Um, and then intentional pacing. Um, so a core part of narrative design is knowing how much of the story to give to the player at a time. Because you never really get the entire story of the game through one play of the gameplay loop unless it's really, really small. Pacing is also a little bit more abstractly understood in terms of design because it's a question of feeling. It's because you're trying to figure out a good rate for delivering information and emotional beats and giving the players space to experience these things or influence them. Versus in like film and books, we don't really have to worry about pacing the same way. Those things do have pacing for their own plots, but those the pacing can't be altered because like, again, the, the player is not or the audience or the reader is not part of that system that is telling the story. So it's just a question of whether or not that, that person reading or engaging with the story is choosing to move forward and they can go back or whatever versus in game design, the player is kind of both more an active participant and like kind of sitting back. So we have to like choose how we're delivering the content to them and be very deliberate with it. So. All of these things are very big words and very complicated. So it's kind of easy to just erase them all and say that it's narrative design is the art of providing story with game mechanics. Um, and story in games, to, th this might seem to kind of familiar to people that were here for my workshop last year. Every single game has a story, all of them. This is either intentional or otherwise, because this the story found in a game is either provided by the designer or gained by the player naturally. The designers can provide as little or as much story in the design of the game as they want because players will naturally fill in blanks with their own experiences playing some more so than others. Designers can't control the way a player experiences a story. We're just here to guide the process. We provide the content, but we can't choose how the player feels about it. So the essentials of a story for games are kind of determined project by project because every story has different needs. It's impossible to apply a universal story structure to every project and expect unique results um, because we have to consider the player an active participant in the story. We can't just say like, here's our main character. He goes through this, this, and this at this point and this point and this point because players might struggle at certain parts of the game. Like this one boss fight that should be kind of like an early action in the game, like an, or an early beat with more intense stuff later on. It could be really intense for a player if they're like struggling to beat it. Like we have to anticipate a lot of possibilities within the realm of storytelling and how those stories will be interpreted. Um, we also need to consider how often story content is directly in front of them. Do they have a say in the direction of the plot and how often do they have this power? And what narrative role do they inhabit by playing the game? Are they an observer? Are they somebody causing these actions? But important to note, this is not a writing workshop. 
Games writing and narrative design share responsibilities, but they are ultimately different crafts. A lot of times when working in games as a narrative designer, various different studios will ask you to do one responsibility or the other or both, and they'll label it something else. But I am not talking about writing. I'm specifically talking about narrative design and how it applies to games. To go over the quick differences of writing versus narrative design, writing is game-centric. It's about the content that goes in the game. It's the actual in-game text. It's what the player reads, sees, and hears without any prior knowledge of the development process. It's the thematic elements of a story. It's world building and character writing. Essentially, writing is about creating the story that is being told. Versus narrative design has an element of creation to it, but it's player centric and systems and design and experience centric. It's using the mechanics and the systems as tools to tell the story and deliver that story. It's determining the way a player interacts with the story. It's designing the story and how it's told. So you can think of the distinction between writing and narrative design as content creation versus content delivery. Because some people know how to write like for days and days and days, but then don't know how to format it correctly to put into a game. Versus some people don't like to create the writing at all, or they don't like have a brain for like in-depth lore documents, but they can design a system of like dialogue or exploration that delivers this content perfectly. And these two, some people, I didn't say that. Okay, maybe I did, but I didn't. Okay. Um, writing is used to justify the system designed and characterize them in such a way that validates the format of game design and storytelling in games. Design is used to deliver the story in such a way that matches gameplay and the overall experience of the player. In a best case scenario, writing and design are planned together so they can cohesively meld into each other as the project matures. Um, in the best case scenario being the operative words there because um, a lot of times in game development pro projects that you're not the lead of, narrative is usually added last. And that's just something we have to deal with. Um, writing before anything can be has been designed for results in cuts and reworking and designing before writing becomes a matter of like kind of playing ad libs and filling in the blanks. Um, so this workshop is design focused. We are going to establish best practices, useful frameworks and important considerations for design when planning the narrative of a game from the beginning stages. Because since you guys are pre preparing pitches for the gaming academy, um, you guys get the chance to think of these narrative things from the get-go and have these considerations right away instead of like waiting to be hired and add them last. So, sorry, I just heard my cat. Um, so the design considerations that I'm gonna go over today are scope, knowing the bare minimum of the story you're telling and the resources available you have to tell it. After that, we're going to talk structure and outline the physical structure of a story and how the player moves through it. And finally, after that, we're going to talk control. We're going to discuss and understand exactly how much autonomy, agency, and control over and within the game system your player will have. So I know that I just kind of like took off talking and like speak at a mile a minute. So we're gonna take a break real quick and just make sure everyone's on the same page because I know some people are arriving late. So is everybody okay so far? Um, do we have any questions so far? Um, Ashraf, I'll leave it up to you to choose who speaks. Uh, yeah, usually we just have people raising hands if they have questions. So we've got Mustafa. Uh, we'll hey. take three questions, I guess, if needed. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, Mustafa, yeah. Uh, hi, quick random question. It's just like on my mind ever since you said it. You claimed every game has a story regardless. Yes. Correct? Are you familiar with the game Black Gammon? Yeah, I am. What would you um, say is the story there? Well, the thing is, is that you can't say it's a universal story for games like that. 
it becomes a question of a player's personal experience with that story. So it could be like, oh, my family member taught me this game. And within the years of us playing it, we've established a rivalry or this one person always wins at it. Or like within a specific round of playing the game, it could have its own emotional beats and like kind of like an overarching narrative of who is like, 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 yeah, the story forms as you playing it. Um, it becomes like its own kind of quick ephemeral experience, not necessarily like a plotted and scripted, like character A, character B thing. Um, I, th I hope that makes sense. Okay, thanks a lot for your input. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think we're gonna take two more questions before we move on. Okay, so we do have a question about your cat. I guess we can see her during the break. And we have a question. Um, yeah, I will be providing pictures of her whenever we take breaks. Um, but also, she she likes to come and sit on my lap when I'm on the computer, but she, it's also like kind of early in the morning for her, so she might be asleep. Um, but that's her right here. Her name is Tana. She's an old lady who's very whiny. She's 16 years old. Um, yeah, she's my baby. Um, I see another question that's about how can I make sure that a novel is actually written can be delivered in the game in a good way? Um, that's an interesting question because adapting a novel to game form, I don't know how often that's actually really done. I know that the Witcher games take place in the same universe as a series of books that were originally published, um, but I haven't read those books, so I can't speak to the experience of adapting them for interactive formats. Um, but the challenge with adapting a linear story to an interactive format is kind of accommodating for like do you want this to be a unique experience for the player or are you just really taking the story and interspersing it with gameplay? Um, because if you don't want to deviate too far from the plot of the novel, then it's like you kind of, that kind of limits the amount of choices you give a player as to what they can do, unless you make it a question of them choosing what they experience when instead of choos choosing like a personality or dialogue choices. Um, so I, I think it varies from project to project and what you actually want from your novel adaptation and like what you want the ultimate narrative experience to feel like. Um, it's hard to give a universal answer as to how to make a novel a game because every project has different needs and different considerations for the story. Um, let's see unrelated, but I can't get my mind off of it. In one of their games that they presented a game about human-like dinosaurs in school before they died of the asteroid. Yes. Um, the game that I'm currently working on is called Goodbye Volcano High. It is about teenage dinosaurs that find out that an asteroid is going to kill them at the end of their senior year. Um, I mean, it's not a self-promo. I'm not, I don't own the game. I was just brought on a few months ago, but it is really fun to work on and is kind of sad. Um, but the creative director on the, of the studio is also Lebanese, which is really fun. Um, how are games solely based on story, good on its own without solid gameplay, like walking simulators, like Firewatch and What Remains of Edith Finch? Um, I'm going to save that question for later because I think I've answered enough right now, but that is a really good question, so I'd like to come back to it. Um, oh, here comes a cat. he won't come um anyway so now that we've answered some questions and my cat is ignoring me let's get back to it so we're going to talk scope knowing your technical and creative limitations um and this is something that applies to not only narrative design but just best practices in game development in general he's not interested in me i'm sorry <laughs> um i have two cats this is not tana this is my other one pip um, and he is only interested in food. But anyway, so scope is kind of a buzz killer um, because it is referring to the size of, and capabilities of a project and the people working on it. And 
To know the scope of the project is to understand the exact limits of your resources, be they financial resources, creative resources, or technical resources and capabilities. And by extent, the most prioritized components of your game and what they need in order to be considered finished or complete. It generally means that super cool, fun, and complicated parts of your game will get cut because it prioritizes the most essential parts of the game that make it what it is. And it sucks. Like, it's not fun to be like, oh, we don't have time for this super cool feature that we really wanted to add. Um, and narrative features tend to get cut from scope really, really easily because they are considered just writing by a lot of teams and considered easily changeable. Um, and in general, we're usually the last ones added to a project in terms of like core development of, a, of games. Um, so we're expected to be able to work around other disciplines and adapt really quickly to changing parts and things getting cut. And it's not a fun process, but it's something to be aware of. We can prepare for these scope cuts by understanding the exact bare minimum of our story and what it needs in order to be told. Um, and one thing to consider with scope is that the least important and most costly features are always what are removed first. And this applies to narrative. If there's like, if you have a really complex branching game that needs to get reduced severely, you're either gonna get cut down by the word count or a lot of branches are gonna get trimmed off and make it a much more linear and simple structure. Cuts will be a lot less devastating though if you have a solid foundation of what the story is. The most important part of a story, in my opinion, is to preserve our moments where the player is forced to reckon with the core theme that the game is presenting. If you can distill your theme down into a few interactions, you're set. If your theme is something that needs to have a full, like, like a full epic, like, like the Odyssey or the Iliad, you might want to reevaluate what you're writing and whether or not it has the capability of being done within the scope of your project. Plan your game and its story like at least half of it will be cut by the end of the development process. Nothing is sacred. All of it will be cut. You have to keep that in mind because otherwise, if you refuse to think that anything, that everything has to make, if you, sorry, this is a bit word salad. If you write your game and plan it as though all of it will be there by the end, it will be devastating to realize you don't have time and you don't have the means to put it all in. You need to understand, you need to have a hierarchy of what the most important things are. So to give an example, I'm going to talk about my thesis project that I released when I finished my BFA in game design. Um, whoop, my bad. So my thesis game is called That Which Faith Demands and it's an interactive fiction story about a wandering laborer taking apart the, fall, the remains of a fallen mech, like Gundam style, but the mech is made out of the body of a god. And when I planned this project, I was thinking like pie in the sky, like here are the things I would love to do if this was a fully developed game and not just my senior project. So in the dream features category, a full version of this game to me would have multiple sites of fallen mechs, each with their own different stories and experiences and like providing different insights into the setting of the world you're exploring. And then on each job, you'd work with different coworkers or like a rotating cast of characters um, and get to know them really well and then meet new ones and get more insight to what you're doing through them. And then I also really wanted to have in-depth narrative driven character creation that flavors the world and changes the text of what you read, what you see, what you experience. Um, so then, Going from there, if I couldn't do everything I wanted to have in this game, then I was like, okay, well, how about instead of a ton of mechs that you're excavating, maybe just a few, like two or three, um, and they each have a different story. And instead of having a rotating, a huge rotating cast, like maybe it's just a core team of a few non-player characters. And then we'll have basic character creation to provide flavor text and exposition, but we won't go crazy with it. And the absolute bare minimum of the story that worst case scenario, if everything fell apart, this is all I had to deliver by the end of my, my senior year, then I would have one excavation site with a specific mech and a specific story. And I would not have any other characters or if I did, they'd have minimal roles. It would just be the player and prose. 
So what my game ended up being at the end of my development process was one excavation site, but then I had a consistent cast of NPC characters and NPC characters, NPC coworkers and basic character creation. I did not get to do the dream features at all, but I, I knew I wasn't because I understood that this was an eight month, eight month long process and I would be doing other courses on top of that and other jobs on top of it. So I provided the full spectrum for myself of what I would love it to be and what it has to be. And then I found myself able to develop in the middle. Um, and that's something that I highly suggest you do for your pitches as well is just like think pie in the sky. Like if you had all the money and the time in the world, what would your game look like? And if you had to put this game together in a month, what would that look like? Um, it's just a useful process to understand that your, pro your game isn't going to be a permanent thing. It's going to be an evolving process that you adapt to as you go and understand exactly what you're capable of and how much you have to work with. So the big question for thinking about scope are what are the most important pieces of the story you want to tell? What parts of it cannot be cut without changing the fundamental nature of the story and the game? That's the end of the scope section. So now we're going to talk structure. I don't know if this joke will land for non-native English speakers or non-Americans, but I apologize. Um, structure, I hardly know her. Um, so knowing the structure of an interactive story is one of the most important parts of writing for games. Because when you say like games writing, this is what people immediately think of as like flow charts and branches and like different paths and outcomes because film, media, books, like they, they don't have that. They have a beginning, middle and end versus we can have a beginning, 50 different middle parts and like 10 endings. Like we get, we have a lot more freedom to experiment with structures. Um, so quick terms for, that I'll be using when I discuss structure. Linear stories are a sequence of events that happen in the same order every time the story is told or experienced. So like, beginning, middle, end. And the beginning is always the same, the middle is always the same, the end is always the same. Branching stories are most common in games and they're stories where the series of events are altered depending on the player's choices. Branching is the, my basic term that I'm using here, but it isn't always the most accurate word to use because there's a ton of ways that story structure can be altered. Um, but for simplicity's sake, this is just what I'm gonna use. Um, so branching stories, if you're making a story with multiple paths and or outcomes, one of the most important parts of the process is balancing your alternatives. If you're, when you offer multiple paths to a player, if they're going to experience like a ton of dialogue and get new items and like, like find out some secrets of the universe on one path and then they just get like a dog on the next one, well, maybe not a dog, maybe like, like a cool plant. Um, on the next one, they're probably not gonna choose the other path. Like they're going to want to take the option that get, delivers them the most content. Um, so you wanna make sure that all the, op the, the choices you give to the player are balanced in their outcomes in terms of like weight and interest to the player and content gained. Superficial choices on the other hand, like quick things that don't in influence an outcome, they don't necessarily need to be balanced, but it can still be weird if they're like super duper different and have the same outcome. Like if you can talk to a character and you can like, like verbally like bitch slap them, or you can be like, oh, that's nice. And you choose to be really, really mean to them, but then you get the same dialogue outcome as if you were nice. It's like, why did you give that choice in the first place? Like it's, it's gonna be really jarring for the player. Um, so, and that's something you can have fun with at times, but in general, best practices for designing your choices and your branching structures is to know um, what parts are the most balanced and like how you can make experiences feel unique, but also of equal importance. So choosing the right structure for your game. There's merit to both linear and branching structures. Not every story needs 50 possible endings. There's some games out there that have beautiful, incredible stories and always have the same ending. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no best or worst way. Um, 
But generally speaking, branching structures are ideal for replayability and the idea of players having influence and being able to make choices that matter. Some games have a mix. So maybe the main plot of a game is set in stone and pretty linear, but then side content that you do can have multiple outcomes or vice versa. Maybe the main plot of the game is something that you can have a lot of room to explore, but then you have a few basic like linear side stories. Linear stories can still have unique playthroughs. Just because the events remain the same doesn't mean the player's experience has to be. Um, and this can be done through like other gameplay loops, like maybe allowing the player to choose a different class or something, or maybe by choosing a different character creation beginning um, option at the beginning of the story means that their perspective is shifting. So they view the same events in a different way because they chose to be an elf this time instead of a dwarf, stuff like that. So um, because it's kind of hard to talk about structure without talking charts, I have prepared some charts, many charts. So this is the basic three act structure, which is generally the most common structure of analysis for film and literature. So it's the first act, the second act, and the third act, beginning, middle, end. Within these acts, there are their own structures and like beat patterns that are pretty common. Um, and the acts are all kind of in different lengths, but the order of emotional beats and events is the same. So thinking for games though, what if we provide options within those acts? So act one will always start here, but then once you get to act two, they can explore in their own way. And it's still the same sequence of events, but, or it's not same sequence of events, it's the same sequence of emotional beats and, and narrative experience, but the options themselves are really different. And then the ending sequence bottlenecks down into a few options and then always ends in the same place. Or there's secret events, or there's other endings. Um, it's much more useful to look at the, the story structure as like a map of locations that you travel through um, because it like gives you an, a perfect way to visualize like player is here, they will go here and then they can choose to go here or here. And if they go here, they can go here and they can go here and then skip all that and go here. Um, so it's, it's drawing your flow charts are super duper important. One of the most important parts of narrative design. Um, but also when you're designing your structure, don't forget to bottleneck. What bottleneck means is if you have a lot of cascading choices and options like spreading down, you got to gather them back up um, because otherwise you're going to have to accommodate for like 50 different endings. And it sounds fun at first, but once you have to write like the first five of them and then the next 10 of them, you get really, really tired. Um, but things don't also necessarily have to be in a linear, uh, not a linear, but like in a strict path progression system. What if it's a bit more randomized? Like all of the scenes you can do in act one are either randomly chosen or you can choose to experience them in any order before you move on to act two. Um, and that allows you to have a little bit more creative parameters instead of just like experience this story, then move on. Um, it can be like, once you've met a certain character in act one, you can then move on to the next act. But if you want, you can keep exploring and gain other stuff. Or maybe there's a specific quest you have to complete regardless of the events you experience. Or you have to complete at least three of the five available events in act one before you can go on to act two and so on and so forth. Um, this is a slightly more abstract vision of narrative design and also kind of like why the term branching path isn't totally applicable here because it's like if you branched every single possibility it would look like a spider web so it's simpler to just think of these as containers and then infer the player can take different paths so this is an example again for my thesis um so looking at the beginning the chart of my game um since it's a game with character creation and excavation as the main gameplay this is what it looks like. So the beginning of the game is the interview where you are applying for the job of excavating mechs. Um, and this serves as character creation where you're able to determine who you are, where you came from, what your last job was, why you're doing this job, et cetera. And then you get to take a shuttle ride to the excavation site. These things always happen in the same order, always. 
the outcome, the res, what you choose to say and be during those things can change and that will impact other things later. But ultimately, you always start the interview, you always ride the shuttle to the mech, you always get the job. Um, and then the main phase of the game is a little bit more abstract than just events that you can experience in any order, because I have it organized where you can explore the physical location of the mech. So you start at the legs, and then from there you can access the right arm, the head, then the left arm, and then the chest. And then depending on how much you explore the head, the chest, and the legs, you can find a secret tunnel that takes you from one to the other. Um, at any point during this game, if your coworkers are in the same place as you, then you can talk to them and then return to where you were. After a certain amount of time has passed in the game, then you are required to take your lunch break and then the lunch break ends and you return. And then after more time has passed, if you've already taken your lunch break, then it takes you to the end sequence of the game. And then within each physical location, there are, there's like a hub location that you can do and then experience events and then go back and then events and then go back and events and go back. And those events will sometimes unlock other things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the coworkers themselves also have their own structures. Like here are two characters that I included. I had four total and here are two of them. They all rotate throughout the mech, but then um, have different requirements for how you're able to interact with them. Um, so like, this is your supervisor, Maya. Um, if you haven't gotten any work done and you're just trying to talk to her over and over again, she will get really mad at you and not want to talk because she thinks you're wasting time. If you've gotten some work done though, then you can talk to her and ask her questions about your coworkers, ask her for advice. Um, and then this stuff didn't end up happening in the full game, but I was thinking like, if there was really weird shit going on at the mech, you could also narc to her about it and be like, hey, there's some scavengers here that don't work for us and they're stealing our stuff. Or, hey, this mech is talking to me and I don't know why, stuff like that. And then at any location, if she's there and you're in the middle of an event, you can ask her for help with what you're doing. On the flip side, this character, if you try to talk to them before the lunch break, they're not going to interact with you because they're focused on the job. But during the lunch break, you get to meet them for the first time. And then after that, once you've been introduced, then you can ask them questions here and there, like ask their opinions about coworkers. Um, they can ask you about your background, ask about the mech, talk about God a little bit. Um, and then similar to the boss, if spades is at the same location as you, they can help with excavation. And then that might lead to other events if they're present for them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is all like kind of high level stuff. Like this is, I've, I've been working in narrative design and playing with structures like this for a while. So this is not baby's first game, but it's an idea I wanted to provide you with to understand exactly how these structures can exist and be played with. Um, and this, in, this game specifically is also an example of integrating physical exploration with a, a linear story, because it always happens in the same basic sequence. Like you get the job, you take lunch break, you end the game, but the events in between that are kind of free form and up to the player to explore and they can go as in depth or as little as they want. Um, so to tie this back to scope, which we talked about previously, it's really, 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 really easy to get carried away with planning and making huge complex branching charts. You have to keep scope in mind whenever you're planning your structure because every time you add a new path or a new outcome, that's more work. It doesn't, it, it's fun to be like, to, to, to come up with things, but actually implementing, creating, and polishing these things is so, so draining. The ideation phase is always more fun than the polishing phase. And when it comes to structure and wanting to give the illusion of like, or wanting to give the player a really big, broad experience, work smarter, not harder. Think of ways you can give the player an illusion of branching and unique content without creating too, unique, too many unique systems and assets. Like when I was talking about earlier with a linear story where the framing might be different if you play as an elf or a dwarf, um, ultimately you're not creating whole new paths. 
you're just tweaking what's already there and kind of spinning it in a different direction or like lifting, like covering up one thing and then lifting another. Um, like it's, it's a, it becomes a matter of framing instead of a question of paths. And again, bottom neck or die. This balloon beyond you, you'll never finish anything. It sucks. Bottleneck or die. So the big question for this game that I want you to, or not this game, this section that I want you to consider for developing your games is what would a map of the story look like if you included all possibilities available to the player? How will the player move through the different paths available? Okay, quick, one last Q&A before we take like a 10 minute break. Uh, is it possible to mix randomness and the bottleneck approach or are they too different? Um, can you explain what you mean a little bit more? Um, if you'd like, there is another question as well uh, by Ed. Uh, how many storytellers or narrative designers must be on a project? And if you have more than one, uh, can they have different opinions and ruin the game? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think there's no right answer for this. Like you're gonna hear me say this a lot. There's no universal answer for how much is too much on a, a game. Um, what matters most is that you guys are able to cooperatively disagree rather than like ruining the game. Um, because it's like, this is something you're gonna have to get used to in all facets of game design, not just narrative design, but uh, game design is, a collaborative field. And if you want to write a story that only you want to write and you only want to write it for yourself, uh, write a book. Because game design, you're going to have to cater to the ideas and opinions of not only your teammates, but also your players. Um, so you can write a story that's like as indulgent and like self-serving as you want, but if you put it in front of a player for playtesting and they're like, oh, I didn't really get what was going on, you're gonna have to change something. So in terms of how many storytellers is too much and can it ruin the game, um, there's no limit on storytellers. There's just a limit on egos. If you don't know how, if you don't wanna collaboratively tell a story, then you need to work together, come up with that story together with other people. Um, in general, it's best to come into a game project being willing to think of something new instead of bringing in like a baby project um, that is like super precious to you that you have to make it look like according to your vision. And if anybody disagrees with you, then they're ruining the game. Like that's that's not a conducive, that's not a good behavior conducive to making good games. Um, you have to be willing to build things from the ground up instead of just um, playing tug of war with what you want. Um, and then yes, that question about how games solely based on story are good on their own without solid gameplay, like walking simulators. Um, so something that both Firewatch and Edith Finch do really, really good, do really, really well in my opinion, having played both of them, is they um, make really, really great use of unique mechanics. They don't provide a ton of like different outcomes or uh, like, how do you say? like branching choices, like if they're both pretty linear stories, but instead of like sitting and watching a character move on a screen, you are expected to move with them and like guide them. And like, you have to be the one who's climbing a, a cliff in Firewatch. Like you're the one who's like um, putting like markers in the campgrounds or in what remains of Edith Finch, you're exploring this house um, and crawling around it and reading and experiencing the memories of the people who live there versus if this if what remains of Edith Finch was a movie we would just be watching people on screen do those and we could get up and leave and the story would finish without us but in terms of games even in walking simulators those stories will never be finished without the player they have to have somebody behind the wheel um so it's just a matter of figuring out how your player can interact with the story in a way that will resonate with them. Um, 
I am familiar with the game Hades. I don't know what I can say about the scope because it's a big game made by a studio that has made several games. And I think like one person did most of the writing on that game, which is insane to me. So I don't have much I can say about that other than don't expect to make it Hades-like for your first game. Um, yeah, it's either the Iliad or the Odyssey. Like there's there's a lot of lines in Hades. Um, and then the question explained. So the random events happening, which means that the players won't be able to go through everything that can happen in the game, but also get the same specific endings or specific event. Yeah, that's, that's totally possible. Um, because it just becomes a matter of like, I don't know how much you guys know about like programming and conditionals, but instead of it being and this and this and this to get an ending, it can be this or this or this or this. Like you can, you can um, have. Yes, I've been told my character. I mean, chat my cat ears. Um, um, but uh, it becomes a question of providing multiple ways to get the same outcome. Um, and then for outcomes that you want to be super duper common, you can provide a ton of different ways to get there. But then for outcomes you want to be super rare or special, then you limit the options and ways of getting there. Um, I hope that helped. Um, are there, is there anybody raising their hand? Doesn't look like it. How did an indie studio manage this much narrative content? That's actually kind of an interesting thing I really admire about Supergiant is that they, they value narrative a lot more than a lot of other studios. Like they have every member of the team, every discipline working on the early prototype of the game from the get-go. So like music is something that's also added last usually. But in the case of Supergiant Games, they have their composer helping them make music while they're still figuring out the game. So the narrative is something that they hone in on right away and they work on it to its completion. Um, yes, their older games have voice narratives, narrators as well. Um, the other thing with Supergiant is they are indie, but they're also kind of like establishment indie. Like they've been getting more and more acclaim with every game they make and by extent more resources. Um, so if Hades was their first game, it would be a insane. But the thing is that their first game is Bastion and Bastion is kind of rough. And then Transistor expands on things they did in Bastion, but um, is also its own thing and it's pretty small. And then Pyre gets a little bit bigger than both of those games. And then Hades gets even bigger. Like, in terms of them being an indie studio able to accomplish a lot of things, one of the reasons they're able to accomplish what they do is because they've learned so much from their previous projects and you can see what exact systems, mechanics, and work styles carry over through the games. Um, yeah, I liked Bastion, um, but I played Bastion after playing their later games. So going back to it was like, oh, this is cool because it's, it's nice to see their origins, but it's also like, I'm used to more quality of life and considerations that they would only have because of what they did on Bastion. Um, but anyway, this is not Jenna's video game opinion power hour. It is break time. So uh, take a quick break. Um, I will answer some questions. We have another Q and A section at the very end, so don't worry. Um, and then, if there's more questions I don't get to, I'm putting my email and stuff up at the end so that you can reach out to me. And I can't promise I'll get back to everybody, but I'll try. Um, anyway, so take, oh, ah, cat's up for adoption. Oh my God. If you guys are looking for a cat, you should adopt these cats. Uh, we'll be back in a bit. Yeah, I'll turn my video back on. I'm not right. sure if you guys can see me because the screen's being shared, but whatever. Um, okay. So um, I hope everyone's back because if they're not back, they're going to have to play a game of catch up. Um, but I talk really fast anyway, so it's probably easy to get lost. Anyway, the last part of our big presentation is going to be talking about control, which is understanding what systemic influence is afforded to the player. This is uh, 
this is, I think, another very abstract part of narrative design because I'm, it's hard to really envision or understand, but uh, I'll do my best and I hope that it's comprehensive to you guys. So to give you a quick definition of player agency, it's the defined limits of a player and their ability to move freely within a game system, like open exploration versus railroad. Um, in narrative design, player agency is expressed through the choices available and by extent unavailable to the player. Uh, like, I don't know if you guys know this meme, but like here, here's some agency. You can ask questions, you can be silent, you can dismiss the story, or you can just fucking glass him. Um, uh, this is an example of choices available to people. So um, driving the story, to give you a better example of how I'm talking about like agency and control is think of a game like a vehicle. All your games are different types. Some are on limited tracks like trains on railroads and others have a ton of freedom and possible routes like cars and exits on a highway. The player is in the vehicle, but when it comes to determining their control, you as the designer are choosing whether or not they're driving it or if they're just a passenger. If the player isn't the one driving, then the system is, and it's not autopilot. Um, so, well, actually, I'm not, I'm not quite ready to talk about this yet. Um, so when it comes to driving the story, it's like you're choosing what part of the vehicle the player has control of. Um, are they the one with their hands on the steering wheel? Are they the ones with the gas pedal? Do they have the ability to stop and just look around? Are they driving to certain points, getting out, smacking enemies around and getting back in the car and driving forward? Or are they like doing Mad Max shit where they're like on top of the car with like a flaming guitar and like shitting things? Um, I don't want Disney to sue me because I know this is gonna be recorded and I can't afford it. Um, Cause Disney is very, very bad with uh, suing people. Um, Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, anyway, so that's this is like how you can envision the control you're getting. And then when it comes to the choices you're providing to the player, a common misconception is that providing more choices is a better story. Um, no, that's not true. Because players can get choice fatigue and get really overwhelmed by choosing too many things and lose interest in the story. There's also some players that get overwhelmed by having too much control and will like, overthink every single choice they get to make. In general, a few intentional choices is better than a lot of choices that are there for the sake of quantity. I mean, depending on the kind of game you want. If you want it to be a game that's like completely procedurally generated and like completely different every time for the same player and like randomization and stuff like that, then yeah, you want a lot of choices for quantity. But in the case of a game where you have like a very specific theme and experience that you want the player to have, be deliberate with the choices you provide. Don't just provide a choice for the sake of having it there. By using the options you give and require of the player, you're determining whether or not they're the proactive or the reactive party. And what I mean by this is like, if you're playing a survival horror game, your player is probably the reactive party because they're trying to survive the system. They have tons of enemies coming at them. They have ton, like nothing, they don't have their choice of weapons. They're just grabbing whatever they can find. They're exploring for the sake of surviving. Like they are reacting to the story and everything that comes at them versus in like management sims and or in games where you're like developing and overseeing a territory and its resources, you're the proactive party for the most part. You might react to some things here and there, but you're guiding the way this situation develops. So to go back to the car, like, are they driving the car or are they, tr are they like clinging to the, the, the back of the car and like trying to survive and hold on? And this is something that can vary across the genres. And also something to keep in mind with uh, intentional choices or a lot of choices is sometimes it's effective to limit them or remove them entirely. Like if you want the player to get into an argument with a character, then providing only mean options, just different types of mean is a way to do that versus like if you try to provide too many different options and it's like, okay, well then if they don't get in a fight with this character now, then this payoff won't 
be worth it later, stuff like that. So to kind of expand on what I was talking about earlier, when you're planning the role, when you're planning the story of a game alongside its mechanics, consider the in-game role of the player. Like I said, if it's a horror game, are they trying to survive deadly odds? If it's a management sim, are they responsible for overseeing developing territory? Is it open world? Is progression largely unguided and based on free exploration? The role of the player in their gameplay, like whether or not they're killing or surviving or exploring or spending or buying, stuff like that, that helps you decide the role of the player in the narrative and what power you give them. They don't have to match, um, but it's effective when they do. And when they don't match, if you're doing it intentionally so that they have a different amount of control over the story than they do over the gameplay, be deliberate in that because there's there can be some dissonance if they don't line up. And that dissonance can be effect wielded pretty effectively, but it's hit or miss. But anyway, like it, to kind of specify what I mean, it doesn't make sense for the player who's a random citizen to make decisions impacting an entire em empire. Like if they're just like a blacksmith in a little village, then why should they choose what the king does in terms of war? But if this is a game where they can climb the ranks and go from like citizen to knight to commander to like advisor or something like that, then it makes sense for them to get more power and influence as they go. Because the control you provide a player doesn't have to be a static thing. It's something that can evolve throughout the course of the game. Yeah, chosen one narratives are kind of overdone though. But anyway, to tie this back to scope, as previously mentioned, the structure of your game can get really, really huge with that scope in mind. And this goes both ways with control. The more control you give the player, the more you have to account for any and all possibilities of what they try to do. If you say this is a game in which you can do anything, players are going to try and do anything. They will, tr they will want to do as much as they can. They will push to see how far they can go within the system you provided. On the flip side, if you give most of the control to the system, you need to make sure that the system is as watertight as possible because as soon as the player sees a room, uh, sees room to do something they previously weren't allowed to do, even if it was intentional or otherwise, uh, they're going to go for it. They are, they are going to get in that little opening and then try to break things just because people like to do that. Now thinking of control and structure is, when you're designing your story structure, ask yourself how much of the decision-making power is afforded to the player. Is there random generation? Are there specific conditions to be met? Are the same choices available every time? Control is given and taken away by determining what factors lead to which outcome and choosing how those factors are influenced. Um, and it's totally possible to have a branching structure where the player has little power over the outcome or a linear structure where the player is the driving force. And I encourage you guys to play with it when you're designing these things. Um, yeah. So the big question when it comes to control and design is which is the reactive party, the player or the game system? Who accommodates the other? How much of the story and movement throughout the game is because of the player and how much is despite them? How much do they have to keep up with it? Um, so this is actually kind of the end of the presentation, I guess. So. Any last words or final questions? Uh, this is not my cat. This is Bear. He lives across the country from me. He's very fluffy and he is dumb as rocks and I love him. Um, if there are any questions I missed earlier, if you want to repeat them in the chat so I can see them, let me know. Um, okay, let's see. What do you think of a game where after the first playthrough you can play it again, but it'll have a bunch of different occurrences and will lead you to a completely different ending, which is the true ending? So that's actually a very good question. And I have what might be considered an unpopular opinion there, but I actually don't care for that very much. Um, I know it's common in a lot of visual novels and RPGs, but I prefer to be a little bit more respectful of the player's time. I think replayability should be a choice, not a requirement. Um, because some people only have time to play one game here and there outside of other things they do. And if you can't experience the full game without sinking hundreds of hours into it, then I think 
I'm probably not going to play that game Um, because I love experimental narrative structures, but I also value my time and am aware of what I need to do. And I don't want to feel guilty over not experiencing the full game. Um, But I think it can be fun, though, because it can be fun to like foreshadow things in the first playthrough that through a second playthrough are really obvious um, and like have more consequences and weight to them. I just don't think that it's necessary for every single game. And I think there is merit to games that experiencing them once and only is still a complete experience. Um, do games like Baldur's Gate 3 or Divinity Original Sin 2 narrative design work similarly to other games like Witcher? Because these games are often multiplayer mode during the campaign, I was wondering if that affects anything. Um, so I haven't played those games, but I have a basic understanding of them. I think, I actually think games with multiplayer campaigns, but then a solo story, I don't think they totally work. Um, I don't, I don't think, I think if you're going to encourage people playing with other character, other, other players, then there should be consideration of the fact that you're not alone in the world in the story and you shouldn't be treated as an individual, like specific entity. Um, if, if you're in a campaign or a game where you're being treated as an one in an army of many, then I think it works. But if you're like the chosen one by playing this game and all these other random players aren't, it's hard for me to ignore the fact that they're chosen ones in their own games and campaigns. Um, and it kind of like breaks the immersion or kind of like makes the experience a little bit silly for me and reminds me that, oh, this is a game that I'm playing with other people instead of I'm in this world with other people also adventuring with me. Um, I hope this answers the question. What software website and tools do I prefer using? I like to use Ink for narrative design. Um, Ink is a narrative engine that is completely text-based, but allows for a lot of flexibility and like kind of interesting ways of weaving the story and the narrative um, in ways that other software like Twine or Yarn Spinner don't. But uh, it's something that varies from every project. In general, I like to use my projects with ink and like, like to plan my projects around it. But it's something that I like to think of as like, okay, I want this story to be experienced this way and in this structure, so what software can I use that will accommodate that? Um, because in personal projects, that's something I get the liberty of choosing. But um, in a lot of career moments where in like jobs I've been hired to, I've been hired on to, I generally have to learn and adapt to whatever software they're using. I am working at my best when it's an in ink though. Any online tools that help in narrative design and do tools like Twine help prototype structure? Yes, 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 yes. Twine is I think the best online tool you can use um, because you can do everything from having like a, a small like quick prototype to understand like, like mapping which choices go where or you can develop Twine into something huge and complex and beautiful. Um, and there's like, thousands and thousands and thousands of words in some Twine projects or other times it's like quick, like bam, 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 just to understand the prototype. Um, and they're both super useful. And I highly, highly, highly recommend using Twine because it is online and free. And also I'm a little bit biased, but the creator of Twine was my narrative design professor. So help him out. Um, how do I feel about something like Kentucky Route Zero where there's the element of choice, but you're hurtling towards the same fate because it already happened before players even clicked start game? Um, I think that that's something that's effective in some genres, but will get easily oversaturated. Oh my God, wait, hi, Sahil. <laughs> it's my friend. Um, it's something that will get like kind of easily oversaturated if it's like every game where you're like, I am making these choices, but the ending is inevitable because I can get kind of boring doing it too much. But I think when it's used effectively, it can be really, really compelling in driving home a specific point or like melancholy. Um, the show don't tell dynamic in video games such as Sek Sekiro displayed in the opening fight against Genichiro. 
Um, I think Show Don't Tell is an interesting tool for storytelling, but I don't know that it's always super effective in games because um, people miss things in games even when you tell them. You could put a like a paragraph of lore in front of them that explains the exact situation they're in and they'll ignore it anyway. You kind of have the, the responsibility of games narrative designers is um, understanding that just by telling the player something once does not mean it will sink in. So instead of having one really big heavy statement that's super important, you can reiterate the theme in a lot of different ways so eventually they pick up on it. Um, I don't know, games aren't always super well built for subtlety. They can be, but uh, doesn't always work depending on the player. And an important thing for that is play testing to see if players pick up on things. Excuse me. If you wanna know what my favorite game is, um, that question changes a lot, but generally my favorite game is Transistor by Supergiant Games, the same studio that made Hades. Um, it was their second game. It came out when I was in high school and it was one of the games that made me wanna get into game development. Um, how do I rein myself in when coming up with ideas and you're like, oh, maybe this is too far indulgent and doesn't serve the overall story. Um, if I come up with an idea that I think is sick as hell but won't suit a project, I save it. I usually have like a graveyard document for every project I work on where it's like, I, don't, I can't use this anymore, but I don't want to delete it entirely. So I'll cut it out, paste it here and save it for a project where I think I can use it. Um, and reining yourself in is something you just kind of naturally teach yourself to do as you work on projects more and more. Um, because when you're working on like baby's first game project, then the instinct is like, oh, everybody says not to make your magnum opus for your first project, but this, but I, surely it'll work for me. Like I can definitely make my super duper incredible in-depth million word game story for my first project and nothing will go wrong. Um, and the only people who can get away with stuff like that are people with rich parents because they don't have to worry about surviving. I hope that makes sense. Um, what did I use to create my presentation slides? I actually do credit the, um, the source I got these from. I didn't make this template, I used it and I will include the link at the end. I mean, players can ignore the lore, but it's also like, that becomes a question of what are you playing the game for? If it's a story-driven game where the main appeal is the story and what's happening and somebody ignores all the lore for it, they might be inclined to say that, oh, this is a badly written game because I didn't understand what was going on. But if it's a, it's a, if it's a game that's a mix of like fun gameplay and lore and some people are just doing it for the gameplay, that's okay. Um, how did I come up with a mech god excavation idea? And where can you find my games? Um, I, yes, uh, jenkodon.hio is my itch page. Um, and that is where you can see my thesis game. And I've also actually been releasing a series of devlogs on it, explaining my process and how I came up with things. Um, and quick explanation as to how I came up with the game, like quick, uh, like quick cliff notes. I spent the summer of the, the first summer in the pandemic of 2020, I spent a lot of time watching mecha anime and playing games with my friends that were like mecha role-playing games. Um, and then as for the whole God thing, uh, I've always been interested in weird intersections of divinity and science and then in general, the game itself is kind of an exploration for me of what it feels like growing up in a shambling empire that is the United States and feeling disenfranchised as an Arab person growing up post 9-11 and dealing with like watching how society feels about people like me and like living like a few miles from the nation's capital and like being indoctrinated with like all of this propaganda about our imperial history and like believing that we're justified in doing what we do. 
Um, so really the game is like me screaming about capitalism and religion and war and imperialism and being adrift in the midst of all those things. But also giant robots are fucking cool and wouldn't it be sick if they had bones and blood? Oh, not yet, not yet. Um, my baby's first game, I don't even remember anymore because I went to school for game design. So we had the luxury of being like, make 50 different prototypes, do not care about any of them, just get them done. Um, so I actually don't even remember the first game I ever made. Uh, uh, oh, the other thing that kind of makes that hard is that I started off making board games rather than video games. Like they had us start doing tabletop and physical games before we were even allowed to make digital games because they wanted us to just focus on the theory and not get caught up in the technical limitations. Um, so the first game I ever made for that class was a game called Haunted Hotel where it had a bunch of moving pieces and things that would light up and some of the power would go out in the rooms and you're, you're trying to escape but all the floors were shifting and shit like that. Um, and it was very complicated and it was uh, not totally functional at the end of it, but it was a fun process to make. The games that include a morality system? Uh, I generally am not in favor of them because I think as game designers, we have a responsibility to take a moral stance on everything we create and everything we say with our games. So I feel like giving the player the option to do terrible things with no consequence other than people are just mad at you is maybe not the way to go. I don't know, it's, I'm, I'm pretty firm in my morals. So like, I don't think I'll ever work on a Call of Duty game or if I work on an FPS game, it's gotta have some very, very specific properties to it because fundamentally I am very anti-gun and even though I don't think video games cause violence, I live in a country where gun violence is off the fucking charts and I would rather not do anything to contribute to that culture. Um, I think games should challenge the morals of the people that play them and encourage them to think of the actions that they're engaging in. But in terms of a morality system in a game, eh, eh it's not my thing. Sorry, I'm playing catch up. I have 57 new messages. Um, any perspective on writing for kids games? No, I'm sorry, that's not my expertise. I'm kind of an edgelord, so I write about blood and guts and things. Um, what year did I get into video games professionally? 2020. Um, I started, actually, this is kind of a sad story, um, but I started after the August 4th explosion in Beirut because I was teaming up with a Lebanese YouTuber and some other Lebanese artists to create merch for a fundraiser. Um, it, the fundraiser didn't end up happening because the YouTuber um, has a lot of health conditions and like personal life stuff that end up making it impossible for him to run the fundraiser. But the other artist I was working on that project with ended up hiring me for my first gig in job, uh, my first gig in games a few months later. And on that project, I was a background artist and then a few months later became a narrative designer on. Yes, that is a Himalayan breed cat. Um, my board game was not a solo project. I was working with a few upperclassmen, which is why I was able to be fancy and do things that light up. Um, I was just along for the ride. Um, as for getting a board game balanced, the answer really just is play testing. Like you just have to iterate on things as much as you can. Yeah, no, Ashraf is right. Um, my writing my own D and D campaign. I have tried. It's a lot of work. It's not fun for me because I write every day for work. Um, when it comes to role playing games, I prefer to be a player rather than the DM because I am basically a DM for a living and it's exhausting. Um, and then uh, how would a collaborative project that involves more than one writer, narrative designer play out? Um, kind of 
kind of hard to explain. I've worked on projects where I was the lead designer in a team of a few of them, and then others where I'm completely alone or I'm an editor that's answering to a producer, stuff like that. Um, I think what's important for having multiple designers and writers on a project uh, for narrative stuff is to establish kind of like guidelines of what the project will look like and what like the tone of it is that you both follow like fall like a style guide kind of that you both have to adhere to um but in terms of best practices i can't really say because everybody is different to work with so there's not like one universal approach but the best thing i can say is just be open and be willing to collaborate and don't be too defensive of your ideas um because i think the worst instances i've ever seen of development processes are where teams or writers or designers are pitted against each other and are trying to fight tug of war for their story to be told that's not how game writing should work if you don't want to collaborate with people don't get in the games um let's see ideas are cheap ethos i'm not sure i totally am familiar with that Um, people say you can make tons of ideas. Uh, I mean, it's implementation that's hard. I mean, yeah, that's that's very true. Um, I, d I don't know the ethos. I'm not familiar with it, so I can't give like a super poetic answer. But I would say that they're probably right. It's a lot easier to come up with things than it is to implement them. Um, yeah, I did, I did see your, your question about writing for kids games. Um, I'm, it's, yeah, it's, I'm not familiar with it. I'm sorry. Thoughts on games like the Oprah Din and Papers, Please? Well, I think the Oprah Din should be a little bit more firm in its condemnation of the slave trade and British colonialism, but I think the mechanics of it are pretty cool. Um, and Papers, Please, I also think is cool. I don't know. I, I haven't played either of them, but I've read about them. So I understand their basic mechanics um, and like what they expect to do of the player. And I think they're really effective in like immersing the player in their worlds because the interactions available to them are so much more unique than just fight, run, climb. It's like stamp these papers and read them. Like you, you have to get like really, really specifically involved in the game in ways that you aren't required to do in other games. Dragon Age Origins had six different openings that made players familiar with the world. I find this interesting. Also, every character had their own multiple endings. That must be so hard and complicated to design. I agree. It was very cool and really fun for a player, but that's the kind of thing you can only really accomplish with like a full team of designers and writers and like external funding. Multiple paths, but one ending. I think it's fine. I don't mind it. I think when I'm playing the game and experiencing the ending, my main question is, does it make sense to have every route end in the same place? Um, because otherwise, what's the point of having those paths? Um, I don't know. I, I'm a firm belief. One of the things my narrative design professor taught me is that you should never have a pointless choice. Um, you should never, like if you're asking something like left or right, you should, you need to provide context and something that guides the decision-making process. And you should, if they're going to result in the same outcome, then why are you bothering to ask that question? Um, I think The, the, the main thing that paths serve to do in a game with only one ending or outcome is it provides you ways to, um, it provides you ways to explore the world differently. So if the paths are distinct in how they inform the player, but aren't necessarily 
the player doing different things, then I think it can end in the same way because you with the, the main difference is that you come to the same results, but with different knowledge every time. And I think there's something to, there's something to be done there. Um, as for one path and many endings, I, I don't know that I've ever played a game like that. Because that usually means that everything comes down to one choice right at the end. And that makes or breaks the ending for you. And I don't know that I've experienced anything like that or really seen that in a way that, oh, Mass Effect 3. Yeah, well, Mass Effect 3's ending is infamous for a reason. Um, I haven't played Cyberpunk 77, 2077, whatever. How many sevens? Um, that is... What do you think of having a game? Okay, that's a that's a very long question, and I I'll answer that privately if you reach out to me later. Um, but I think it's a little bit too meaty to really get into right here. Um, oh, thank you. I'm really happy. Um, it's getting a little bit late here, so I actually and I actually do have to go soon. So I'm going, and I don't want to keep you guys up too late anyway. Um, so before I go. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is since all of you guys are preparing game pitches for the Gaming Academy, something that's really important to planning the narrative process is a story Bible. It's a multi-page document providing the overview of characters, the world, and the story of a game. It also has the basic idea of structure and narrative mechanics of the game and has diagrams, flowcharts, and pro pro proposed scenarios and outcomes. Um, we don't have time to really make a whole story Bible in this workshop, but I think something that could be really useful for you guys, especially if you're doing narrative driven games for your pitch is to create this and to get feedback and see how readable it is. Because the story Bible is both for people working on the project, but also people that you're pitching it to um, because it needs to be concise and readable like a Wikipedia page. Um, but then it also needs to be a point of reference for anybody working on the project so they can go there and get a concrete answer instead of having to sort through 50 different notes. Um, you don't need to use an online tool. You can just like make a Word document and do it and organize it however you want. Um, I just make mine using Google Docs usually. Um, yeah, you can do whatever you want with it. Anyway. Um, yeah, there are there are a lot of templates online and there's some places where they're like like example ones are uploaded and there's some narrative designers on Twitter that are like, hey, this is what a story Bible looks like when I when I do it. Um, stuff like that. Typing speed to be a storyteller. I'd say it doesn't matter, but unfortunately, you should probably be able to write fast because game design timelines can be kind of unforgiving. Um, I don't know. Don't get crunched, but also don't take your sweet time writing things. Uh, oh, something I didn't mention is that unfortunately, a lot of the times in game development, when you're writing, your first draft is the last draft. Uh, we don't get to edit things quite as, as much as we, we wish we could. Um, we get time to write placeholder text and then they're like, okay, we don't have time to make that any better, ship it. Um, so beware. Anyway, um, thanks for listening. Thanks for coming to my presentation. Um, I really appreciate you guys asking questions and being engaged. I'm sorry if it was like overly silly. I'm sorry I put... <laughs> I'm sorry I put Lightning McQueen in there, but I did put him in there at two in the morning. So what are you going to do? Um, this presentation was created by SlidesGo. It was really useful. I really, really like this presentation. I apologize for my sins. Um, and then if you want to reach out to me after the program, I'm on Discord as Jenkudon number 2097. Uh, I don't know if I'm in the server. I don't know if you guys made a new server, if it's the old one, but whichever, I'm not in it. Um, and then if you want to email me, which is your best way of getting like a detailed answer from me, um, email me here at jyow at hey.com. It's the old server. Oh, and I'm not in there. I might have left or something. Um, glad you guys liked it. Thank you.
Also, um, shout out to Ashraf and the rest of the organization team for letting me do this again. All right, great. Thank you so much, Jenna. This was honestly wonderful. Yay, uh, I'm glad. Yeah, for sure. So uh, thank you again for coming and you know giving us a wonderful session. And I guess we'll see you around on the server. Thank you everyone for yes. attending as well. Yalla. Take care. Oh, I'm still in there. Then I have no idea where it is. All right. Anyway. Okay. Bye guys. Yeah.